Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the latest in our series of SCC Zoom speaker events. I'm Rebecca Bailey. I bet if you cast your mind back about a year ago, there's a good chance you thought the pandemic might be over by now, as we know that's sadly not the case. With vaccination campaigns at different stages throughout the world, and as, um, as borders remain closed and fears grow over virus variants, COVID-19 remains as present a threat as ever before. So we're very lucky tonight to have one of Hong Kong's top experts to talk us through it all, Professor Ivan Hung from the Hong Kong University's Department of Medicine. You'll probably recognize him from a lot of media appearances recently. He's published more than 230 international peer-reviewed original articles, mostly on influenza, respiratory diseases like coronavirus. He obtained his medical degree from the University of Bristol Medical School, and he worked in Cambridge and London before returning to Hong Kong in 1999. He was awarded the Anti-SARS Gold Badge Award for his role in combating SARS back in 2003, so it's not his first rodeo. There's a huge amount to talk about, so I will crack on. I do want to say, if you have questions, please send them to question at fcchk.org. That's question singular at fcchk.org. And please do try and get them in as early as possible so we have as best a chance as possible as getting through them. Um, that's all from me. I shall hand over to Keith Richberg, our moderator and FCC president. If you send in questions, you might see me later asking them. Well, great. Thank you very much, uh, Rebecca, for the introduction there. And thank you for joining us, uh, Professor Hung. We really appreciate it. We know it's an imposition on your time, but there's so many questions and so many people interested in this. It's really important. So I'm really glad you're doing this. So I understand you have a presentation. Is that correct? Uh, indeed, yes. Great, great. So we'll go to your presentation first, and then uh, we'll come back. And I've got a whole lot of questions here. And if members of the audience have a question, uh, if you want to hear your question asked by Rebecca in a British accent, you can send it to question singular at fcchk.org. But without further ado, uh, Professor Hung, the floor is yours. So uh, thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks again for the chairman for the very kind introduction. And of course, the FCC for uh, inviting me again after I think roughly a year ago when I was speaking here uh, and then now uh, the pandemic uh, hopefully is coming towards the end. We just turned the corner and hopefully coming to the end uh, ve very soon. Um, and of course, uh, instead of talking about the, uh, the virus itself, uh, my talk today will be on vaccines and variants. Uh, although I would do a bit of recap on the virus itself and of course, uh, briefly on the treatment, uh, updating the treatment on COVID-19. So this was around the time when I first gave a talk uh, for FCC uh, in around 5th of March. And of course that time, the epicenter is very much in China uh, and of course in uh, South, Af South America and also in, uh, in India uh, and also, um, most part of Europe, uh, UK and US is just the beginning of the, uh, the outbreak uh, in those places. And of course, uh, turning to now, in fact, 1st of June, uh, that the current epidemic, uh, the epicenter is very much in India, in Brazil, uh, and of course, many places, including US and UK, uh, the tides probably turn uh, after the vaccination rate is now up to about about 50% of the population. And hopefully the, uh, the outbreak there will be contained very, very soon. So you can see that uh, basically United States is still top in terms of the number of cases. Nevertheless, the, in terms of new cases is very much happening in India, uh, of course, because of the, uh, the Indian variants and of course the uh, unfortunate um, the, 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 the treatment available as well as the, the vaccine is uh, basically um, very much in demand in India. Uh, and of course, similarly in, in Taiwan, I think they are facing the similar situation where originally in Taiwan, there are very, very few cases, but unfortunately there's an outbreak happening right in Taiwan and, and the number of uh, mortalities is going up. 
In Hong Kong, on the other hand, we are coming or we have already come to the end of our fourth wave. Uh, as such, it took us a long time uh, over a period of five to six months to, to contain the fourth wave. Uh, and very fortunate, of course, is that uh, the latest uh, very small outbreak of the South African variants in the community has come to an end uh, after very tight infection control measures imposed. Uh, and of course, the um, mortality rate is relatively low of 1.8%, and hopefully we are seeing the end uh, and that we won't be a fifth wave coming uh, once we got our vaccination rate up. Transmission, of course, very, very uh, important because now we find that the, uh, a lot of cases are actually asymptomatic. And that's probably because of the relatively long incubation period. And of course, there was a so-called asymptomatic shedding uh, towards the end of the incubation period. And a lot of people actually did not have any symptoms, especially with those variants. And we have already proven that. In fact, last year, when we uh, screened our returnees from the Diamond Princess cruise, uh, and that from that cohort, we are able to pick up nine adults, uh, basically coming, have been contracted, have contracted the infection. And among those nine people, uh, three of them, in fact, were symptomatic. The other six remain asymptomatic throughout. So we already know that one symptomatic case behind, there are likely to be two asymptomatic uh, cases. And of course, we were first to report a reinfected case of phylogenetically distinct from a young um, uh, man who returned from uh, initially contracted the infection uh, locally in Hong Kong uh, with very mild symptoms. And then five months later, of course, when he returned from a trip from Spain via UK, he remained asymptomatic, but simply when he was screened at the airport, he was picked up to have a phylogenetically distinct reinfection. Uh, and of course, the antibody uh, was negative initially, was subsequently raised very rapidly over a period of one week uh, to a very high level. So we know that people, when they get a second infection, very likely to be asymptomatic. Uh, and that, of course, they will be uh, have a much higher antibody level compared to the first time so-called like a prime boost effect, similar to the two doses of vaccine that you receive. And of course, infection control measures remained very, very important. And why Hong Kong doing so well is because of, of course, the uh, strongly rely on the community with a very good compliance of facial masking, social distancing, a very tight border control, and of course, uh, hospitalizing uh, all our uh, confirmed cases, uh, with these moderate to severe cases treated in negative pressure isolation facilities uh, with a very early treatment given. And of course, those with mild disease were uh, being quarantined at the Asia World Expo Community Hospital until they turned negative before discharging them. High risk population, of course, are those who are in the elderly. Even though most of our cases were between the age of 20 to 69, uh, most of our cases who died are about the age of 70, majority, of course, about the age of 80. So we are concentrating in treating these patients very early on. And this, of course, based on the pathogenesis that we uh, find, in fact, similar to SARS, is that the first week is characterized by viral shedding and the rising of the viral load that we use antiviral to treat our patient, followed by the second week, which is characterized by hyperinflammatory response that we should be concentrating using steroids and also other immunomodulatory agent before the patient recover in the third week. And in terms of antiviral treatment, we are using a early combination of antiviral therapy so as to increase the potency and reducing the resistance and controlling the viral load very early on so as to prevent cytopathic damage, bacterial co-infection, and of course, most important, reducing the risk of cytokine dysregulation that happens in the second week. And very early on, we are already using drugs readily available by repurposing these drugs, including interferon beta, and also the other drugs, including things like Kalitra, Remdesivir, which is a new drugs to treat our patient. Uh, and by far the most 
uh, potent is in fact interferon treatment. Uh, and of course, the early studies at the NIH uh, show that remdesivir is very good in controlling the clinical symptoms and improving the outcome of, our, of the patients. But however, because of the late treatment that the, was given to the patient, they were unable to show a difference in terms of viral load or viral suppression. And similarly, in the, most of the WHO studies, that again failed to show a difference in interferon, hydroxychloroquine, remdesivir, or leponavir, which is Kaletra, because of the very late presentation or very late starting of the treatment. And of course, the heterogeneity uh, of the management of patients in different countries that randomized these uh, patients uh, into their cohort. However, in our study that was published in The Lancet, we were able to show a triple combination by using interferon beta 1b together with Kalitra, uh, which is basically loponavir, rotonavir, and also ribavirin. In an early treatment, when almost our patient was given a treatment from day four from symptom onset, and we're able to show that by using the triple therapy, uh, the clinical symptoms as well as the viral load come down much quicker compared to just giving the Kalitra alone. And this basically proved that the interferon is the backbone of the triple therapy. And this, of course, proven subsequently by various studies in vitro study published in the cell and also in science that uh, the virus itself actually suppresses the interferon, the, the holes interferon, and hence allowing the virus to, to replicate very rapidly. And the same in, in patients who have life-threatening COVID-19, they have an anti-interferon antibody presence inside intrinsically. So if you are able to replenish and give interferon to this patient, they will of course improve much quicker and they are able to recover um, clinically much better than those without giving the interferon. And the same of course, subsequently in a recent study published in Saudi Arabia in treating MERS using the same combination interferon beta 1b together with, uh, with Kalitra for MERS with a far better clinical outcome uh, when compared to just giving placebo. And subsequently, of course, another study that was published uh, in the Lancet Respiratory Medicine uh, by the Toronto group, again, showing using interferon lambda as an outpatient for five days, again, is associated with much better clinical outcome and also viral suppression uh, compared to giving just the placebo. Uh, and of course, it was given outpatient because in Canada, they actually manage the patient, uh, most of the patient as outpatient. And these patients received the treatment again very early on from day five from symptom onset. However, if you missed the opportunity of treating the patient from the first week of, uh, from symptom onset, all you could do perhaps is to give steroids to control the cytokine reaction. And that of course is, uh, these study result associated with better outcome in the uh, basically the recovery study published uh, uh, in UK when they give most of the lay presenters uh, with a so-called desimethadone, uh, which was of course steroids and associated with better outcome. Nevertheless, the mortality rate is still pretty high at 23%. And similarly, you can give plasma therapy uh, to uh, associated with better outcome in elderly patients, there was a study, this study uh, from Argentina. And of course, in Hong Kong, we have been harvesting and giving plasma therapy uh, to severe cases with a, again, a significantly better outcome in our ICU patients. Other immunomodulators, including giving tocilizumab, which is an anti-interleukin-6 therapy, again, associated with better outcome uh, in patients. And of course, another study by using baricitinib together with remdesivir, uh, again, uh, associated with better outcome. Nevertheless, these studies should be given to patients in the second week from symptom onset to control the immuno, uh, the cytokine storm. And similarly, at using the antibody cocktail that was uh, received by uh, President Donald Trump early on as given an early treatment, Again, it's associated with a better outcome when given as a combination to uh, antibody as a combination therapy. 
And this study, of course, recent uh, result had shown that it's actually uh, remain active if you give this combination antiviral uh, of a cocktail against the variants, including, of course, the UK, the South African, Brazilian, and also the including the US variant as well. Now turning to COVID-19 vaccine. This was, of course, taken from the New York Times that currently we have 92 vaccine in clinical trials uh, over a period of uh, just uh, 18 months. Uh, and of course, uh, eight of them has already gained approval for full use and seven of them have gained early and limited use. And this, of course, based on four platforms, including the mRNA platform, the Pfizer-BioNTech, the Moderna platform uh, that is widely used and followed by, of course, the uh, adenovirus platform, including the Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine from the chimpanzee adenovirus, the Johnson & Johnson, the CanSino from China, and also Kamalaya from the Russia. Another very important vaccine that currently in phase three trial, including the Novavax, which is a recombinant protein trial, and also Vector Institute, is again, we're waiting for the phase three results. The inactive vector vaccine platform that recently gained the WHO approval, including the Sinovac and the Sinopharm, uh, and also the Sinopharm Wuhan, and also the Indian Barak Biotech, is the inactivated conventional vaccine platform that are very safe to use. Uh, and also uh, proven to uh, have a, a pretty good efficacy. So uh, the vaccine, most of them, in fact, are based on using the spike protein, which is on the uh, on basically the uh, superficial layer of the virus. And that's important for attaching the virus to the uh, ACE2 receptors in the human cell. You can use the entire spike protein or you can use just the receptor binding domain as the antigen uh, for, the, uh, for, the, uh, for the vaccine. Another way of doing it, of course, is just by using the RNA segment uh, of, the, uh, of the virus as the uh, vaccine or using the recombinant protein as the vaccine antigen. So the four platforms are uh, here. Uh, the first one, of course, is the uh, mRNA vaccine which of course using a segment of the RNA from the, uh, of the SARS-CoV-2. Uh, the, uh, because the instability of the mRNA segment is basically coated with a lipid particle before being injected into the human cells, uh, and where the, uh, basically the messenger RNA will combine from the, spe the spike protein. Very important to know is that the, uh, the mRNA is very unstable, and it only entered into the cytoplasm of the human cell. It never, never entered into the nucleus uh, and never is being integrated into the host DNA. As a result, you don't have to worry that it's going to change your own DNA or it's going to result in other things, including sterility or other problems that will create a mutant as such because it never entered the host nucleus. Uh, the spike protein, however, will be expressed on the cell surface where it will be taken up by the uh, antigen presenting cells, the dendritic cell, and hence able to stimulate the downstream, the T cells, together with the B cell to provide the antibodies. Also very important is that it has a very, very robust cell mediated immunity, thereby the antigen presenting cells stimulating the cytotoxic T cells directly, and hence is able to lyse the infected cells directly. And this is very important uh, uh, to confer a very robust long-term immunity uh, in the host. The second platform, of course, is the uh, adenovirus vector vaccine, which is basically uh, another relatively new uh, technology. In fact, both, however, have been uh, on trial uh, for more than 10 years. For the end of the virus vector, basically the, uh, the segment, the DNA segment is around by the carried by the adenovirus uh, being carried into the whole cell where the, um, the subsequent the RNA is being uh, expressed uh, and then uh, formulate the uh, spike protein being expressed on the cell surface and subsequent, of course, stimulating both the TB and also the cytotoxic C cell similar to that of the mRNA vaccine. 
The third platform, of course, is the whole cell in the activated uh, vaccine, which is a very conventional strategy by using the uh, RNA virus uh, as a whole and then injecting it uh, directly into the host and subsequently being uh, taken up by the engine presenting cells and hence able to stimulate the T and the B cell provide, uh, uh, producing the antibody. Nevertheless, the downside of course is unable to stimulate the cell mediated immunity. And as a result, uh, the uh, antibody stimulation is not as good compared to the mRNA or the uh, adenovirus or the recombinant vector vaccine. Uh, however, it's able to stimulate a su su uh, the sufficient neutralizing antibody as protection. For the Novavax, it's a new technology where it uses basically a uh, segment of the spike protein being in integrated into the virus DNA and hence subsequently um, in vitro, where it's uh, using the MOS cell able to formulate the recombinant protein. And subsequently, the recombinant protein able to extract it and then join combined with a priming uh, particle where it's able to formulate the vaccine before being injected into the human, taken up by the engine presenting cell together with a T and B cell and cytotoxic T cell stimulations. So uh, this again will be able to give rise to a very good cell mediated immunity, similar to the RNA or the adenovirus vector vaccine. So this probably is a very important summary, summarizing the current data of the various vaccine towards the uh, various kind of variants. And then of course, the most of the data come from the Pfizer-BioNTech, where uh, against the wild type from the Israel data, Israeli data, where they have more than 1.2 million people, is a clinical effectiveness study, not an efficacy, but an effectiveness study, where they actually carry this in the community with a 97.5% uh, efficacy against the uh, original strain, the D6140 strain. Against the UK strain, the N501B117 strain is 91.5% protection. No data currently against the P1 strain from Brazil. Uh, against the South African strain, uh, where there are three mutations, the N501Y, the E4144K, and N417N uh, 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 on the spike protein uh, is 75% efficacy. Against the Indian strain uh, recently performed by the Public Health of England, uh, with uh, again the E484Q, the L452R mutation on the spike protein with an 88% efficacy. So it's, it's in fact very good. Despite the drop site dropped in antibody response, the protection is still remains. For Moderna, we're still waiting for the uh, data against the variants. Uh, against the wild type is 94.1% protection. The coronavac, which has just recently been approved by the WHO, against the wild type is 62% if given more than three weeks uh, apart, the first and second dose from the Brazilian data. Against the P1 strain is 50.3%. Uh, no data against the UK, South African, or the Indian variants. For the Sputnik V, which is, of course, a Russian adenovirus vector, 91.6% against the wild type, D614G. No data against the variants yet. For the AstraZeneca adenovirus vaccine, the wild type is 82.4% were given 12 weeks apart, in fact, from the latest data. Uh, and then, of course, the UK, uh, the uh, B117 strain, 74.6%, about 58% against the P1 strain. Uh, one study show is merely 10.4% uh, for the South African strain. Nevertheless, it was a relatively small study and we're waiting for more data to come through. 60% uh, for the against the Indian strain. So unlikely for the South African strain to be that low. So again, we're waiting for more data to, to come through. Johnson & Johnson, 72% against the, uh, the, the wild type, 87% against the P1, and 64% against the South African strain for symptomatic disease. Novavax that are currently, in fact, the study uh, are, are finishing off uh, against the wild type, 89.3%, the UK strain, 86%, 51% against the South African strain. And again, we're waiting for the uh, final data to wrap up uh, and hopefully it will be published very soon.
interesting data coming through for the volunteer, of course, is to look at the effectiveness national wide data from uh, Israel. From Israel is basically very, very impressive. Uh, well, once you uh, basically the, the blue line are those who are vaccinated and the red line is though unvaccinated or vaccinated one month later, basically showing that the uh, incidence rate is extremely low once you've been vaccinated compared to that of the unvaccinated uh, of uh, the death cases. Uh, also for severe and also hospitalization. Also very interesting is that even though against the, uh, uh, for the South African, the, the UK, the South African or the P1 strain, the antibody actually dropped quite significantly for the, uh, for the various variants after given the BioNTech vaccination in those who recover from the, uh, from the uh, COVID-19 uh, after the first dose. Nevertheless, the antibody level is still remains pretty high, uh, even though it's likely to be more than like a 60, 70% drop. But the antibody level still remains significantly high uh, to protect the individual against the infection. So, uh, so as a result, that is give rise to a very high efficacy against the variants, despite a neutralizing antibody drop. For the AstraZeneca vaccine, of course, uh, we see that uh, even when given 12 weeks apart, uh, the efficacy or the, uh, the antibody level still remains pretty high against the UK, uh, Brazilian, or the South African strain. Uh, even though, of course, there are slight worry about the uh, thromboembolic uh, events uh, against, of course, the uh, platelet antibody that causes a very, very infrequent side effects of thrombosis of, um, of, of, of very few patients in uh, those under 60, uh, mainly female subjects, uh, who are, uh, most of them, of course, are a high risk if they're from the Scandinavian origin, likely to due to an autoantibody uh, against the platelet causing the thrombosis. Lately, of course, it's just recently published a few days ago, are uh, the BioNTech data uh, for children, uh, adolescents between the age of 12 to 15, with again, a very, very robust data showing that it is 100% vaccine efficacy uh, after giving the two doses. And of course, uh, the, uh, it's a very, very safe vaccine. So uh, again, uh, in US, UK and Canada already, they are rolling this, uh, the vaccination program to cover the adolescents. In Hong Kong, of course, we had uh, uh, an improvement, of course, in the vaccination rate that currently 2.4 million doses have already been administered, uh, of which 21.3% of the total population have been give, have received the first dose with a 15.8% in receiving the second dose. And of course, there are a lot of uh, various kinds of incentive, including the reduction of quarantine period for those who have been vaccinated, if you are returning from overseas. Uh, and of course, if you're uh, 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 coming back from uh, uh, very few cases, places including Australia, New Zealand, then it's a seven plus seven, basically seven days in hotel, 17 at home quarantine. Uh, for US, UK uh, and Europe, then a majority of course is uh, 14 plus seven. So seven days in, uh, 14 days in hotel plus seven days in at home. Uh, and of course the compulsory quarantine period will be very much shortened uh, to seven days if you have been vaccinated at home. Uh, in terms of the uh, uh, patient with chronic illnesses, in fact, you can safely receive the vaccine, apart from those who have symptomatic disease. For example, if they have hyperpressure or they have chest pain, uh, they are not well controlled, then we will recommend these uh, patients to see your general practitioner before receiving the vaccine. Otherwise, you can safely receive the vaccine. For patients who have uh, two drug allergy or more, then again, they should undergo the skin testing before receiving the vaccine. However, if you only have one um, drug allergy, you can safely receive the vaccine. For those who have anaphylaxis history, then again, we will recommend you to see, uh, to attend the allergy clinic before receiving the vaccine. So I think uh, another very important uh, data to publish here is that we see that in US and UK, where they have already given uh, 
um, basically a uh, half of the population have received the vaccine or at least one dose of vaccine, you see that basically the uh, number of cases uh, reduce really rapidly. Uh, the same for UK, apart from there's a slight uh, rebound because probably related to the Indian variant outbreak that are currently taking place in UK. Nevertheless, if you look at those data from Israel, UK and US, that basically the, uh, the number of new cases drop rapidly uh, uh, once the vaccination program have rolled out to more than half of the population. Uh, and again, it's a very interesting data showing that uh, the, the risk of receiving a vaccine uh, is, uh, is extremely low for those, especially uh, above the age of 55 is four in a million, 11 in a million for those 25 or above. Um, in fact, much high risk, of course, from dying with coronavirus. If you're elderly, 800 in a million, 23 in a million, uh, even, uh, for those who are relatively young, um, dying from an accident or injury, 110 in a million, 180 in a million, dying in a road traffic accident, 38 in a million for those under 25, 55, 23 in a million for those above age of 55. Even they have data for being hit by nightling, uh, one in a million uh, for the overall. So you can see that basically receiving vaccine is extremely safe. And of course, in Hong Kong, we very much, unfortunately, is a victim of our own success in the COVID-19 war that we have been doing, doing too well. And hence, people are uh, very lukewarm in, uh, towards the uh, getting the vaccination. Uh, and of course, with the recent incentive, ironically, not because based on scientific evidence, is that uh, with the, of course, the, uh, uh, the, uh, what, the so-called uh, lottery, uh, for winning or grabbing a, a, a flat, a 10 point million flat in Kuntong, proven to, to be the best incentive of all. Uh, in fact, showing that in the last uh, week or so, uh, the vaccination rate had gone up about 20 to 30%. Uh, and I think that in the next two or three days, all the appointment has been fully booked uh, for, sign, uh, for coronavirus. Uh, so basically it seems that the Hong Kong people are motivated by these uh, chances uh, on get on winning a flat uh, or other kind of incentive rather than uh, than actually uh, getting the protection from the vaccine itself. Um, nevertheless, we I think we welcome all kind of incentive, uh, provided that we can get above the herd immunity as soon as possible. Uh, to finish off, of course, is that we are currently carrying out a phase one study uh, from HKU, which is an intranasal vaccine. Uh, based on the, of course, and uh, uh, season influenza vector together with uh, a, uh, a receptor binding domain uh, vaccine. And already we are, uh, have performed this on 35 subjects and we will be rolling up, uh, rolling the studies uh, to the expansion group. And hopefully we'll be able to finish study towards the end of the year uh, with some uh, successful result to be shared with the community. Uh, and this, of course, have the advantage of vaccinating both the influenza and also the COVID-19 together with a very robust protection in the nasal mucosa to protect uh, from uh, getting the virus in the first place. So conclusion, of course, is an ideal vaccine is strongly recommended for all with a robust immunogenicity, especially against the variants. Uh, and of course, the ideal vaccine should be a, a, a robust immunity uh, confer after a single dose and able to prevent infection, symptomatic disease, complication and transmission. Uh, and hopefully we will be able to have this kind of vaccine very, very soon. Uh, with this, of course, I will end by my, uh, the theme song from my favorite tune from Liverpool that you will never walk alone then. <laughs> of course, that very much we have to work together and strongly relying the, of the, uh, the, all the citizens all from the community to, uh, to work together, uh, get vaccinated, and then work together with the institutes, with the government, and of course, very important at the frontline working workers working together, and hopefully we'll be able to contain this pandemic very soon, especially towards the, the end of the year when most of us have received our vaccine. So uh, thank you for your kind attention, and uh, I welcome any questions.
questions. Thank you. Well, thank thank you thank you very much for that, uh, Doc, Dr. Hung. Uh, you you answered many of the questions I had on my list, so I don't have to ask them. <laughs> But uh, really, really, really detailed analysis here. Uh, an initial quick question. Uh, when you went through the list of the vaccines and their effectiveness against the variants, I think you thought the uh, uh, BioNTech was 91% effective against the UK variant, for example, and maybe 75% yes. against the, the South African. I didn't see Sinovac in there. We only get two vaccines here in Hong Kong. It's Sinovac yes, and Sinovac BioNTech. Is actually, What's Sinovac? Uh, it's Coronavac. Coronavac is Sinovac. Okay, so that so that the uh, that's the third one there. That's the what's their effectiveness now? Let's see that again. Uh, against against the various... yes, basically against the uh, the 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 wild type is sixty two percent from the Brazilian study. Okay, so uh, that is uh, if you are given three uh, weeks or longer apart. Mm -hmm. uh, against the Brazilian variants is fifty point three percent. So okay. because of the study was performed in Brazil. Got it. And then uh, no. there's no, no no data yet on the South Africa how it works against the South African no, no variant. Data yet. Uh, no data yet against the Indian variant. No, we're waiting for the phase three trial to come through, and hopefully they will be able to publish the Brazilian data quite soon. Yeah. Okay, got it. And uh, second, quick question: uh, Will we will we need to have booster shots uh, yes. for either of these two that we get in Hong Kong, Pfizer or the uh, Sinovac, which you call Coronavac, on there? Yes. Uh, uh, very, very likely that we would need to receive a, uh, a third booster sometime. Uh, but the timing of the third dose uh, will, of course, depends on uh, they will have to carry some kind of, uh, of, of clinical trial, not, not a full trial because already they are based on the same platform, but they, uh, they need to uh, perform some trials uh, and also with some uh, data before mm -hmm. recommending, of course, when to uh, receive the, uh, when we'll be receiving mm -hmm. The, the, the booster dose. The likelihood, of course, for BioNTech will be a bit longer compared to the Sinovac. Uh, my prediction probably will be sometime maybe the middle or towards the end of next year. Mm -hmm. uh, whereas for the Sinovac, probably will happen sooner, uh, maybe towards the earlier next year or towards the end of the year. That Got they it. may actually have to change the antigen to the one of the variants uh, before formulating the, 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 the booster vaccine. Got it, got it, got it. And uh, an, a couple more questions for me, and then we have quite a few audience questions. Uh, Rebecca is sitting here anxiously awaiting to uh, read all of your audience questions in a very nice British accent. It's send your question to question, singular, at fcchk.org. But uh, from me, Professor, uh, one question. I know, I know from reading that the virus is very difficult to transmit when you're outdoors. It's mostly transmitted indoors. It can transmit outdoors. I'm fully vaccinated myself. I got the BioNTech. Tell me, why do I need to wear a mask when I'm outdoors in Hong Kong right now? Yes, uh, in fact, we are, um, you know, uh, for outdoor, we are strongly pushing once, once we have get over the, uh, the so-called herd immunity level, then uh, the entire population could uh, very likely uh, taken off their mask uh, in outdoor. Um, the reason why we are still uh, asking people to wear the mask outdoor is first of all, uh, we do not know, we have no data yet in terms of carriage, okay? So even though you are vaccinated, you can still carry the virus in your operatory tract and you can still transmit it to those who have not been vaccinated. So mm -hmm. that's the reason why we're still asking people to wear the mask until we get above the herd immunity level, then we all of us can take off our masks. Okay, uh, got it. In, for indoor, unfortunately, that is still a risk, especially, uh, you know, if you are in the restaurant, you take off your mask and do eating, then there is still a risk of transmission. Uh, nevertheless, uh, again, if we are able to get over the herd immunity level, then uh, we can uh, take off the mask uh, indoor as well. Got it. Okay. I can't wait. It's getting a bit hot outside now. I, I'm sweating in my mask here. But uh, another question for you. I'm fully vaccinated. I've got five friends who are fully vaccinated. Why can't we sit outdoors in an outdoor terrace and have a beer or sit on the harbor front and have a beer if we're all fully <laughs> vaccinated? I, I'd very not? much like to do so as well. Uh, <laughs> again, a uh, similar reason, I think, is because of the carriage. So um, that's why we are not asking, uh, we are not recommending, uh, you know, 
uh, you to uh, take off your mask unless unless you are actually uh, if you are dining or, or drinking outside, then you can take off your mask uh, because uh, in, in a group of four, and perhaps you can go up to, to a group of, uh, I think, group of six if, the, uh, if you've been vaccinated. And of course, the, uh, the bartenders are, are vaccinated as well. So hopefully with, you know, with, with more data, and of course, the, um, the, the, uh, you know, the, the safety travel apps also will have your data on your vaccine. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, attached to it. So with that, I think hopefully we'll be able to have uh, allowing, you know, maybe a, a table of six or table of eight that you mm -hmm. can actually uh, be dining or uh, having a, a, a drink uh, outside the pub. Uh, that, okay. that will be very, very good incentive. Okay. And one more. Okay. If someone in my apartment building is infected and they have to go into quarantine because they're infected, I've never met this person. Why do I have to go in the quarantine for 14 days or 21 days if I, as I am, fully vaccinated with BioNTech? Why do I need to go in the quarantine? Why can't I stay home? In fact, the new, uh, the new rules is that if you are not a close contact uh, to that particular patient, then you don't have to go into quarantine. Uh, you, you only have to stay at home for seven days if you've been fully vaccinated uh, and then send the samples along. Uh, you don't have to go to the quarantine camp anymore. <laughs> so ah, that is, uh, is, is uh, <laughs> that's is good news. That's new. you, you made news. That's great. Uh, and very, very scientific as well. Yeah, great. And one more question. Okay, if I go back to visit my family and friends in the United States, and I come back to Hong Kong, I am fully vaccinated. I'll take a test before I get on the plane. I'll get a test when I land back in Hong Kong. Why do I need to go into quarantine for 14 days? Why can't I just go home? Uh, unfortunately, we are still um, you know, quarantine everyone, uh, even though it's been re reduced from 21 days to 14 days at hotel quarantine, uh, plus, of course, seven days alone. Uh, Why? Why? The reason, again, the reason for this is because of the variants. So uh, even though you have a BioNTech uh, vaccine, uh, currently we don't have data because actually there's a Californian variant as well, which I haven't put here. Again, very, very few data. Uh, that we, again, we do not know even though you've been vaccinated, whether you'll be carrying the virus in the upper respiratory tract. And that again, could potentially cause an outbreak in Hong Kong. And again, we're waiting for the, the, the carriage data uh, before we can actually make any further recommendation in reducing the, uh, the, the quarantine period. And also in Hong Kong, uh, the problem is that we have not yet get over the herd immunity level. So there's still uh, a risk if you carry the virus, even though you have not been infected, but you carry the virus, uh, and then you have a risk of passing the virus to the community. But hold, uh, hold on, let me press you on that a little bit. If the BioNTech is 91% effective against the UK variant, 75% effective against the South African, 88% effective against the Indian variant, if I get on a plane, I've taken a test before I got on the plane, I take a test at the airport when I land, why can't I just stay at home? Yes, it's, it's again, is uh, very reasonable, I think. But unfortunately, we are very, very uh, cautious on that. Uh, the, 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 the problem, of course, is that, uh, as I've said, there is other variants that have, uh, in, in, for example, in California, there's a new variant as well. Uh, and that, of course, they are still 10 to up to 25%, if you look at the South African variant, that you can still able to carry. You, you may not be, uh, symptomatic, but you can still carry the virus, uh, even though you take your test. But there will be missed cases or low, uh, you know, a a you know um, uh, a false negative uh, mm -hmm. that you can still carry the virus. And unfortunately, uh, if you uh, go to a home quarantine, and there are still risks that you can pass on to your family, to your friends. Uh, in in in, uh, in in such circumstances, even though the risk is low, I must say the risk is low. But uh, when you okay. get, you know, when you go home, you you need to take a taxi or something, then you can still pass it to someone. So uh, we don't want that to happen. So I think if once we got our herd immunity up to seventy percent, uh, and then of course we have more data on the carriage, I think that we this mm -hmm. could be very much reduced, or perhaps even waived, that you mm -hmm. don't need any quarantine. Okay, uh, and let me, let, let me, uh, pr Professor, let me play devil's advocate just for a minute here. 
And I agree. Everybody should get vaccinated. Anybody listening, I think you should get vaccinated. But let me play devil's advocate. If I go get vaccinated, you're telling me I still have to do 14 days quarantine if someone in my building is infected. If I fly outside of Hong Kong and come back, I still have to do 14 or 21 day quarantine. I still have to wear a mask if I sit out that outside with my vaccinated friends. I still have to wear a mask if I'm walking the dog or standing outside in a non crowded area. What's the incentive to get vaccinated? There's no incentive. Yes, the incentive comes a bit late, I would say. Uh, first of all, you need to get over the herd immunity. That is still as a community as a whole. Okay, so that is important. If you if you just relax, you take off all these infection control measures uh, within a short period of time, like perhaps what's happening in UK right now, you take things off too early before you actually get over the 70% herd immunity, then things will be rebound. And that's exactly what's happening in UK. And I think they are now holding back in terms of relaxing the infection control measures. So getting above the 70% uh, herd immunity mark is very, very important before we can take everything off. Okay. Uh, the other thing, of course, is that as I've said, we have, because it's a novel virus, it's not influenza, we're still waiting for all these carriage data. And, as, and of course, these variance data that uh, many of them are you know, emerging and came on emerging. So we need these data before we can actually make a, a you know, solid recommendation. Uh, and, and of course, reducing all this quarantine period, which we very much would like to do so. The same for, you know, ex, uh, outdoor sports uh, yes. that, you know, that you can have more than, you know, the, the official number of people, you know, playing football mm -hmm. or, or even mm -hmm. for, uh, for, 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 for junior football, you know, that they, they actually requires more numbers on the pitch that I'm, I'm striking for. Uh, okay. and that, you know, that, that will be uh, what we are, hopefully able to achieve towards the end of the year. Excellent. Because I think we're all, we're all with quarantine fatigue by this point, but I'm going to turn it over. Absolutely. To, uh, <laughs> I'm going to turn it over to my colleague, Rebecca Bailey. You did quarantine. Did you not? I did. She did. How I many was, days? I was lucky. I just, uh, I did two weeks only. My husband had to do three weeks. Two weeks and three <laughs> weeks in quarantine. And then they, they weren't infected. I mean, that's, uh, did you have to pay for that? Uh, I didn't, but my husband. Did. Husband had to pay for three <laughs> weeks in quarantine, paid out of your pocket. But anyway, you've got all. I, I did questions. two weeks uh, at home as well, just before they shut down in UK, where they have to do three weeks at hotel. Yeah. <laughs> no, it's it's everybody's tired of this virus. But anyways, Rebecca. Yes. Yeah, so I have um, a question from Dr. Sarah Borwein, who says, "How can we get to herd immunity of seventy to eighty percent?" with a vaccine that's only 60% effective. Uh, she's referring to Coronavac or Sinovac. Yes, uh, a very good questions. Uh, and hence, of course, there are, uh, you know, recommendation that we, we actually need about 80% taken into account, of course, this Coronavac uh, efficacy. But uh, important, of course, first of all, uh, you see that basically uh, now the BioNTech vaccination in Hong Kong have overtaken that of Coronavac. So it's a good sign that hopefully by the end of the vaccination, majority of us have actually received the BioNTech vaccine. Uh, the Sinovac or the Coronavac, in fact, if you look at the, uh, the efficacy, the so-called 62% is our overall efficacy, meaning that you don't actually get the infection. But if you look at the uh, severity, for example, the uh, protection against uh, you know, severe disease or hospitalization is actually a bit higher than that probably around 70 to 80%. So um, uh, I fully understood and I fully agree that, you know, if you have part of the population that actually received the coronavirus, we might need to have a higher uh, percentage, maybe up to 75 or 80% before you can achieve the herd immunity. Uh, the other thing, of course, is that the, uh, the Sinovac, you might actually need an early uh, third dose as a booster as well. And that, of course, may help with the achieving the herd immunity level. Thank you. Um, a question from Richard Ward. We've, you were talking a lot about the fact that we don't know very much about carriage yet, even for vaccinated people. Um, so Richard's asking, when are we expecting that carriage data to become available? Uh, we are uh, in Hong Kong, we are already correct, collecting this data. Uh, and I think in, uh, in fact, for part of the AstraZeneca study that was published in the Lancet, they actually showed uh, the so-called asymptomatic uh, infection also dropped 
quite significantly. So that is an implication of the uh, the vaccine also active against the uh, the the carriage rate uh, in uh, uh, in the vaccinees. Uh, and I think these data will come through very soon, uh, probably within the next few weeks. That we will be expecting some of these carriage data to come up, come through. Uh, and of course, some of them will be coming from Hong Kong as well. Uh, even though the sample size will be smaller, but we will be have we, we will have these uh, results available hopefully by the end of August. I've got a couple of questions about variants. Um, one is Vietnam's detected a new variant said to be a combination of the variants detected in India and the UK. Do you think that will be a, vi a variant of particular concern? And um, another sort of similar question, I guess, what are, what are the factors that go into the genesis of a new variant? How do these, how do these variants keep appearing? Yes, um, for the, uh, the, the variants from Vietnam, I think the, uh, currently we don't have much data. Uh, nevertheless, the uh, mutation is also happening in the spike protein. So the, we expect the, uh, the virus to be more contagious similar to that of Indian or the, uh, the South African variants. But in terms of the, uh, the severity, it remains the same or probably even less severe compared to the original strain. Uh, so we are not too worried about the, uh, the disease itself. With regards to the vaccine, again, we will need more data, but I expect that the, uh, the antibody uh, level or the protection will be similar to that of the Indian strain. Uh, it will not be too different from that of the Indian strain. Uh, but again, we need more data before we can come to any conclusion. In terms of variance emergence, um, I think most of them, in fact, are. Uh, it happens in all kinds of viruses, including, of course, influenza. But if you compare the COVID-19 to influenza, in fact, the mutation rate is much slower compared to influenza. Uh, the virus mutation happens when you exert uh, certain selection pressure on the virus, meaning that, of course, if you give, for example, an antiviral or you give a vaccine, perhaps, then uh, in order to survive, they will mutate to escape the, the vaccine or to escape the antiviral. Uh, and that is basically a, a selection pressure that happens. Uh, and and uh, because the spike protein is the one that's responsible for attaching to the human cell. So most of the mutation actually happens in the spike protein uh, and not in the nuclear protein, which will bring a big change to the virus and probably more lethal as a result. So uh, very fortunate, most of the mutation now just taking place in the spike protein. And uh, one, one last question from Ian Marlow. He, um, he asks, what's the scientific rationale for not exempting young children and babies from Hong Kong's three-week quarantine, even if the parents have been fully vaccinated? Because a child can easily quarantine at home for the third week, and if they end up testing positive, they're unlikely to pass it on to their parents if they are vaccinated. Absolutely, yes. This is basically, again, a family herd immunity that again, we are asking the government to basically have the same, adopt the same policy for children who unfortunately not yet been able to get vaccinated, that they should, uh, you know, if the parents or the elderly sibling have received the vaccine, then they should be treated the same uh, because the, they will have a family herd immunity. Uh, so, um, you know, even though they may be carrying the virus, uh, we know that in children, uh, the symptoms usually are less, but provided they actually been, you know, uh, so-called uh, quarantine at the same period with the parents uh, and that they provide a sample, I think they should be uh, the same uh, quarantine period to their parents who have been vaccinated. Well, thank you for those questions, Rebecca. Uh, a couple, couple more for me, Professor, and, and before we get to the end, we've got a few minutes left. Uh, one question, how, tell me how this ends. If you look back historically, the pandemic, uh, the Spanish flu, 1918, yes. by the end of 1919, <laughs> it just kind of ended. And if you look at SARS, it, it, 2003, well, it, really... it just kind of ended. Well, how does this end? <laughs> how, how, how are we going to see the end of this? The Spanish flu, in fact, never ended. Uh, it, it just that it slowed down because uh, most people achieve their herd immunity naturally. They acquire the infection and hence, uh, uh, of course, with the uh, unfortunate 
uh, you know, uh, sacrifices of a large number of people, uh, you know, uh, before achieving the herd immunity. Um, and of course, the, 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 the H1 influenza subsequently uh, develop an antigenic shift that they move on and, and become a, a slightly different H1 uh, that causes subsequent, of course, uh, uh, outbreaks, but not as bad as that of the Spanish flu. Uh, the same apply for COVID-19. I think uh, the uh, herd immunity will be achieved both by vaccination and also by natural infection. So at the end of the day, probably in maybe hopefully two to three years time, that we will, uh, you know, most of the most people will have acquired the infection uh, either naturally or by vaccination, that we will be able to achieve the herd immunity. And basically everything will basically go back to normal, even though the COVID-19 will still be around with us. But uh, because we have already developed the antibody uh, or exposed to the virus, that the, uh, we have achieved a certain degree of protection. That even if we ac uh, acquire the infection, it will be very mild, uh, a very simple cold and, um, and um, uh, basically uh, relatively mild or even asymptomatic. Got that. And, and another question from me, uh, so there's, a, there's a new discussion going on starting in the United States and elsewhere about the origins of this. Yes. the so-called lab leak theory that it actually leaked accidentally out of the Wuhan Institute of Virology has suddenly come back onto the radar screen. People thought before that that was a conspiratorial theory. Now scientists in the US are saying, you know, it's a possibility that needs to be explored. Can you talk to me a little bit about that? Number one, <laughs> how important is it that we know where this came from? Does it matter? And secondly, where do you stand on the natural <laughs> natural uh, uh, exposure to this virus versus it actually accidentally leaked out of this lab? Um, the current evidence point towards a natural emergence of the coronavirus because we know that uh, from our studies that we were, in fact, HKU was the first to publish that the horseshoe bats is actually the origin of the, uh, of the SARS 2003. Uh, and um, uh, in fact, uh, Professor K.Y. Yun led the group in 2004 and 2005 to study and looking at, uh, basically we catch, uh, we, we, we caught the, uh, the, the bats uh, with the agricultural official uh, and taking sample from them in, in places in Psycho and Lentil Island. We find basically the genetic sequence demonstrated a 95% resemblance to the uh, SARS 2003 virus. Uh, and we published that in the PNAS. Um, and of course, subsequently, uh, we find that most of these virus, in fact, they naturally emerge from bats. And of course, the similar situation have likely to have happened from Wuhan is that they are bats, perhaps either, uh, you know, transfer uh, by after catching and transfer to life mark in Wuhan or from, you know, naturally uh, you know, transferred somehow to Wuhan may have coming from, from places in Guangxi and also in Yunnan, uh, where they are actually based their habitat in. So the likelihood is from the natural sources uh, is still uh, the most likely source. Uh, with regards to the rumors about whether it's actually coming from the lab, from Wuhan, uh, the interesting thing, of course, is that the, uh, the, the study was actually yeah, you know, some of the study that was performed by the, that scientist is actually um, initiated from US. <laughs> so uh, uh, in fact, he, she was apparently collaborating with, uh, with his uh, previous uh, uh, collaborator from, from US that they were doing studies on, uh, on coronaviruses. But whether they actually uh, from actually leaking from the lab, currently there are no evidence of that as such. So, um, I think until we have further evidence that you know the uh, the the, uh, the the virus actually leaking from from the lab, or we have much more robust material, then uh, we it, the likelihood is that the the virus actually emerge naturally from uh, from from mo most likely from bats, uh, okay. natural reservoir rather than from the lab. Thank you, Professor. And one last 
question for me. When you are trying to go to sleep at night and you don't want to be scared by virus, viruses and variants and eeks and mutants, uh, what do you read? <laughs> what do you recommend? <laughs> what do you recommend that we read? Very to get interesting. Get our mind that, off this pandemic. Uh, in fact, uh, I, I've been recently reading books of my son, my ten-year-old son, and uh, he is a uh, he's a, a a big fan of of Raw Dahl. So the the latest uh, book that I'm reading is actually Going Solo by by Raw Dahl. Uh, it's a of course a a autobiography of his, uh, of his uh, you know later part of his life. So um, uh, is 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 a very interesting book, and I, I strongly recommend that to you. Uh, so that's for people who want to get their minds off of pandemic and variants and mutants yes. and the fact, any and kind all. of the raw dog book will uh, get you off the mind of the uh, <laughs> pandemic. <laughs> <laughs> Professor Ivan Hong, uh, University of Hong Kong, my the place where I work. Thank you very much. We really appreciate your time. Oh, my pleasure. And, taking uh, your questions. It's so important for people to really understand what's going on. So we really thank you for taking the time. Thank you very much. My my pleasure. And um, hopefully we'll be able to get over the uh, the herd immunity mark very soon. Hopefully we will see each other and smile will... again without a mask on. Without so a mask, I'm, indeed. I'm looking forward to that day. <laughs> Thank you all for listening. Please keep it uh, track of uh, FCCHK.org for our upcoming events. We hope to see you in the FCC if you are a member. If not, please think about joining and wear your mask. Get vaccinated. Let's get over this thing. All right. Thank you, everybody. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. Take care. Bye-bye. Take care.